Well, good morning. Oh, that was lame. Come on. I want to thank uh, you all for letting me come and speak to you today and for Miguel's introduction. But he got a couple of things wrong about my family. Uh, first of all, none of our four boys live with us. They're all grown up. Three of them are married. I even have a granddaughter and pictures available if you'd like to see them after the service. And he got all their names wrong. It's not Noah, Ben, Andy, and Zach. We named our boys after people in the Bible, that's true, but all from one book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 6. Their names are death, pestilence, famine, and disease. <laughs> and sometimes death comes with me when I speak places. As you can see, famine never has. But um, nevertheless, we love our boys. They're just a little bit strange. I'm, I'm really glad to be here on, on Christmas Day. Uh, this actually is Christmas in the Eastern Orthodox world, and it also has a very, very special meaning to me personally. 44 years ago today was a Monday. I was in high school, and it's the day that I committed my life to Jesus Christ. It was... Uh, really a radical commitment I made. I won't uh, tell you the story, except to say that from that point on, I decided I'm going to go into full-time Christian ministry. I have disappointed the Lord tens of thousands of times, but he's never disappointed me. And what really pushed me when I made that commitment was I began to love the Lord with my mind in a way that I had never done before. And it, it got me into scripture. I wanted to know the text well. And so I'm going to be speaking to you today about the reliability of the New Testament text. This is an issue that all of us really need to know about. And to begin a brand new year like this, it's important to think about these issues. The reason is, if my New Testament doesn't really tell the truth about who God is, or who Jesus is, or whether he was really raised from the dead, or if I can't be sure that that's what the original text said, then I've got a few problems to deal with. What I want to give you this morning is a reason for confidence in the scriptures. But I begin by quoting from some scholars who have disagreed with this confidence. And uh, we begin with that well-known scholar, Dan Brown, who wrote in his book, The Da Vinci Code, the Bible has evolved through countless translations, editions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. You've all heard something like that. You may have even said something like that. The Bible's been translated so many times and retranslated and retranslated. How can we possibly tell what it originally said? Well, we're going to deal with this issue front on, and you're going to realize that's a really stupid statement to make. You'll see that in a while. But there are others who have written something similar. Atheists are now joining the courses. By the way, there's a new kind of atheism out that no longer says that Christianity is wrong. Well, that's presupposed. But what it's now saying is that Christianity is evil. And that's what we have to deal with. Atheism is good, Christianity is evil. C.J. Werleman wrote a book called God Hates You, Hate Him Back. It's kind of a strange title for an atheist, don't you think? God hates you, or maybe, should it be God doesn't exist? But uh, anyway, that's, he wants to be provocative. And then he wrote another book called Jesus Lied. And in it he said, we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. He's right. The originals are lost. He's right. We don't know when and we don't know by whom. He's right. What we have are copies of copies. That's true. In some instances, the copies we have are 20th generation copies. I have no idea where he got this idea from, but I think he made it up. Nevertheless, you read these statements and you say, oh, this is true, and then, oh, okay, I'm not sure about that. Muslims are saying the same thing, and Muslims are a huge uh, a group for us to have to deal with. They have their apologists who are making claims about the Quran. And a, a very well-known British Muslim has written a book called The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation, a comparative study with the Old and New Testaments. M. M. Al Azami is the author. Very, very popular in Britain. And here's what he has to say. The Orthodox Church, being the sect, which eventually established supremacy over all the others, stood in fervent opposition to various ideas, also known as heresies, which were in circulation. 
In each case, this sect, the one that would rise to become the Orthodox Church, deliberately corrupted the scriptures so as to reflect its own theological visions of Christ while demolishing that of all rival sects. Well, what's he talking about? He is saying that the Bible that you have today is a corruption of the original. What he says elsewhere is that the deity of Christ is definitely not taught in the original New Testament. And this group known as the Orthodox Church, which was nothing uh, that even resembles orthodoxy, made up things about Jesus, and they demolished all the other views. Well, where are Werleman and al Azami getting their ideas from? They're not New Testament scholars. They don't know Greek, as far as I know. Well, they're getting it from a number of New Testament scholars, but principally from one fellow who has become the number one theologian in the country as far as the media is concerned. If you ever watch any stories, it's typically around Christmas and Easter is when you'll see these uh, uh, TV shows that are dealing with, well, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, and uh, somebody claimed just a few years ago that we actually found the bones of Jesus. Now, we actually know that that is true. The bones of Jesus have been found. You know what the proof is? There was a bracelet on the left arm and an Aramaic that said, what would I do? (laughs) It's got to be. Well, Bart Ehrman was an evangelical. He went to Moody Bible Institute. He's a graduate of Wheaton College, two very fine evangelical schools. Went on to Princeton Seminary to study under the great Dr. Bruce Metzger, who was... Uh, one of the finest New Testament scholars of the 20th century and an evangelical himself. He got his master's and doctorate under Metzger at Princeton Seminary. And then he began to drift. Later on, he got out of evangelicalism, still called himself a Christian. Years later, he called himself an agnostic, which is where he's at today. But he's also said, if there is a God, it's definitely not the God of the Bible. He's not the God that I could ever possibly worship. Because of his spiritual journey, or spiritual unjourney, or unspiritual journey, Ehrman has become kind of the spokesman for liberalism today, and is the number one theologian, as I said, in the media, newspapers, uh, radio, television. They all interview him because, ah, here's a guy who came out of evangelicalism, and now he's against it. This is where these other people have gotten their ideas from about the text. Bart Ehrman is a bona fide New Testament scholar whose specialty is the New Testament manuscripts. He said, not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. We don't even have copies of the copies of the originals, or copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. Well, he's probably right about that. We're not sure. I don't know about the three or four generations worth, (coughs) but I'm sure he's right in the first or second generation. But Ehrman has made this claim And his writings have impacted tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people who were either marginally within the Christian faith or were considering it, and they've abandoned it. That's Bart Ehrman. Well, it reminds me of a couple of attitudes that we need to avoid as we begin to think about these issues of the text of Scripture. And one attitude is radical skepticism or total despair. This attitude is what I've just presented to you from these three uh, writers. Basically, we can't possibly tell what the original text said. We might as well give up. We don't know. But there's another attitude that's equally pernicious, and it's found among Christians. King James-only people have this attitude. I've even heard some people say, if the King James Bible was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. And when they say that, I say, how about them cowboys? You know, just what else can you talk about at that point? But many of you come to church with your Bible in your hands and you say, this is exactly what the apostles wrote. Exactly. I know that for sure. No, you don't. In fact, today I'm going to say we don't know for sure about some things, but we do have certainty about others. And so there's another attitude that we need to avoid, which is absolute certainty. It makes us uncredible in the eyes of skeptics, and it also shows that we don't know what we're talking about. And when that absolute certainty gets dashed, sometimes people swing the pendulum way too far over to radical skepticism. Well, there's two attitudes to avoid, but four questions that I want us to answer this morning. The first is, how many textual variants are there? What are are these scholars talking about? I'm going to tell you about differences among the manuscripts that's going to startle you. What kinds of textual variants are there? In other words, 
are they, do all of them uh, uh, affect doctrine? Are they just spelling differences? Is it the use of uh, the word the or a or an in some places, differences in word order? What kind of variants are we dealing with? What theological beliefs depend on these textually suspect passages? Is the resurrection of Christ, for example, dependent only on places that are textually suspect, where there's some manuscripts that don't say that Jesus was raised from the dead? Or is it found in the witnesses? Do we have sufficient evidence to say this is a clear teaching of the original New Testament? That's kind of something you want to know, isn't it? What about the virgin birth of Christ? What about the Trinity, salvation by faith alone? These are the kinds of things that we definitely want to know about. And so we finally ask, is what we have now what they wrote then? But before we get into these four questions, we have to ask a preliminary question. And that is, don't we have the original New Testament anymore? The answer is no. It turned to dust by the end of the second century. 27 different writings went to various churches, and they were copied and recopied and recopied so often that these manuscripts just finally wore out, turned to dust. They were written on papyrus, which lasts longer than modern paper does, but it doesn't last forever. And if it's especially copied a lot, it's not going to last uh, more than a century. Well, okay, so we don't have the original New Testament anymore. But we do have copies. Don't they all say exactly the same thing? I mean, if they did, then there'd be no reason for me to stand up and speak to you today. If they did, there'd be no discipline known as textual criticism, which is the science of trying to determine the exact wording of the original of these manuscripts when we don't have those original manuscripts. But the manuscripts themselves disagree with each other. The two closest ancient manuscripts have between six and 10 differences per chapter. Multiply that out over 260 passage, uh, chapters, you've got 2,000 differences between the two closest manuscripts. So because of the differences of the manuscripts and the disappearance of the originals, scholars have to dive in and dig into these manuscripts to see what the original text most likely said. Well, we begin with the first question. How many textual variants are there? Let me define a variant for you. It's any place among the manuscripts in which there is variation in wording, including word order or omission or addition of words, even spelling differences. Single letter differences count. Now, we're not talking about things that can necessarily be translated. In fact, what you'll discover is the vast majority of these differences can't be translated at all. They're so insignificant. Let's see about how many uh, differences we actually have. When you think about the quantity of variants, we want to begin with what we have for a text. For the Greek New Testament, there's approximately 140,000 words, or to be more exact, 138,162, and you don't want to ask me how I know that number. How many variants do we have? Well, the best estimate is about 400,000, or about two and a half variants for every word in the Greek New Testament. If a single late manuscript from the 15th century has a single letter difference and all the other manuscripts have exactly the same thing that's against that, that still counts as a variant. And so we're looking at all the data here and we're saying 400,000 variants. Well, that's enough. Let's close a prayer, shall we? This is the kind of message that you get from the Bart Ehrmans and the Al Azamis and, and the C.J. Wurlemans today. Just this great number of variants, how could we possibly tell what the original text said? When I was studying Greek in college, my Greek professor one weekend, uh, one Friday, told us about these textual variants, and that's all he said. And that weekend was angst for me. How can I possibly tell what the original text actually said? Then the next week, he told us the rest of the story. That's what I'm going to do with you now. The reason that we have a lot of textual variants is that we have a lot of manuscripts. It's simple, really. The more manuscripts you have, the more, man the more textual variants you're going to have. But the more manuscripts you have, the better able you are to recover the wording of the original. So how many manuscripts are we dealing with? New Testament scholars are faced with an embarrassment of riches, which is unlike what scholars of classical literature ha ever have to face. It's, it's just a huge disparity. Among the Greek manuscripts that we have today, the ones that still exist, the numbers come to about 5,824. Now, these are not just small fragments of manuscripts, although there are some that are like that. The average sized Greek New Testament manuscript is more than 450 pages long. There are 2.6 million pages of handwritten Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. 
2.6 million pages. Ten years ago, I started the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. And its intention, its first goal was to take high-resolution digital photographs of all Greek New Testament manuscripts in the world. We've made a good-sized dent in it in the first 10 years. We've taken 200,000 photographs. These are posted on our website, csntm.org. 200,000 pages we photographed out of 2.6 million, ah, about 7%. So we've got a little ways to go, I think. Great job security, though. 5,824 manuscripts. That number, by the way, is the most recent number as of just a few weeks ago because of 11 more manuscripts that uh, CSNTM has discovered, and there's a cataloging uh, institute in Germany that keeps up with this. They're the official ones that count these manuscripts. We have discovered 75 New Testament manuscripts since we began. That's more than the entire rest of the world. All the institutes, all the individuals combined have discovered in the same decade. So the Lord has been marvelous to help us in, uh, in, in our work. In fact, I'm convinced he's far more interested in scripture than we are. And that's why he's opening doors for us to go all over the world to photograph and to discover manuscripts. The New Testament was translated early on in the second century into Latin. And we have more manuscripts in Latin than we actually do in Greek today, which is uh, astounding, of the New Testament. We also have the New Testament translated into other ancient languages, again beginning in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th century, into Armenian and Arabic and Old Church Slavonic, Georgian, Gothic, Syriac, Coptic, a number of different languages. We're not exactly sure how many manuscripts there are in these other ancient versions, but it's at least 5,000 and probably as high as 10,000. In fact, a number of people put it as much, much higher than that, but these are conservative estimates. This means that we have between 20 and 25,000 New Testament manuscripts written by hand before the time of the printing press. That's a pretty good sized number of witnesses, you know? Now, if you had a magic wand and you could wipe all these manuscripts out in, in one fell swoop, the New Testament text would still not be left without a witness. And that's because of people known as church fathers, the bishops, and the elders and priests and pastors and deacons who wrote homilies, sermons, commentaries. And these church fathers did not have the gift of brevity. And consequently, we have an institute in Boiron, Germany, that has been cataloging what the church fathers had to say about the text of the New Testament. How many times they quoted it? A few years ago, the quotations from the New Testament by the church fathers came to more than one million. Think about that. There's only 7,941 verses, less than 8,000 verses in the New Testament, and yet it's quoted more than a million times. That's just, to me, that's just phenomenal, astounding. I, I don't know how to even uh, conceive of that. The entire New Testament would be virtually reproduced many, many times over just from the quotations of the church fathers. Well, how does this compare to other ancient literature? The average classical Greek writer has less than 20 copies of his works still in existence. Less than 20 copies. In fact, that's a very, very high estimate. Most of them have one or two copies. But if you stacked up these 20 copies, they'd be oh, about four feet high, right about here. How high would the stack of New Testament manuscripts be? Well, let's do a comparison. You know, I've got to kind of make it a triple stack. Maybe it's that much. Okay, yeah, a little bit more. No, I, think, I think it's more than that. We should keep going. It's getting better. And that is as much as I could do in PowerPoint. <laughs> Multiply that New Testament stack by eight. And it's more than one mile high. More than a mile high of manuscripts for the New Testament compared to the average classical author, it's about four feet high. It, it, we have so many more manuscripts for the New Testament than anything else in the ancient world. It's absolutely an embarrassment of riches. And so this is a, a radical difference. If it were based just on the number of manuscripts, if someone said, I'm really skeptical about whether somebody ever by the name of Jesus Christ lived, which there are people who are saying such really ludicrous statements, then we should say, you know, 
you're right. I'm not sure he did. But I'm not sure if Julius Caesar ever lived or uh, Augustus or uh, uh, Alexander the Great, all these people, because the evidence for them is so minuscule compared to what we have of the New Testament. It's a huge difference. And so when you have skeptics that are talking about the New Testament that way, they're only talking about the New Testament. They have never thought about this other ancient literature and reflecting on what that would be like. If I'm going to be skeptical about the New Testament and I apply that skepticism to other ancient Greco-Roman literature, guess what? We immediately go back into the Dark Ages. We've eclipsed all knowledge in the last 500 years. But it's not just the number of manuscripts that we're dealing with. It's also the date of the manuscripts. The average classical author doesn't have any copies of his writings until half a millennium after he wrote. There were so few of them, they wore out, and then we're waiting at least 500 years before we see the average classical author's writings, and then just fragments. What about the New Testament? How long are we waiting for that? Decades? Not even a century. Maybe only one decade or part of it. I want to talk to you about one particular manuscript, the discovery of P-52. This was not a fighter plane used in World War II after P-51. This is papyrus number 52. Here's a picture of it. And this manuscript was discovered. That's all it is. It's about the size of a credit card. It was discovered in 1934 by a scholar by the name of C.H. Roberts. But I'm going to tell you his story in just a minute. Let me back, back uh, behind this to a story that gives us a, a sense of how important this, this discovery was. Ninety years earlier, in the year 1844, a German scholar published an article in uh, the Tübinger Jahrbuch in which he said the Gospel of John cannot be dated any earlier than A.D. 160 and should probably be dated about A.D. 170. It was such an influential article with all sorts of philosophical constructs as to how he knew this must be the case that it swept across Europe and continental scholarship for the next 90 years was almost united, almost totally unanimous that the Gospel of John must be written late in the second century. Well, then this fella, C.H. Roberts, comes along and he's at the John Rylands Library of Manchester University in England. He's rummaging around in the basement, comes across this papyrus smaller than the palm of his hand. And he looks at the saying and says, this looks like it's from the New Testament. That's like trying to find the proverbial needle in a, in a haystack because we only have 127 papyri of the New Testament today. So he looks at this thing and he says, this, this is from the New Testament. And he reads one side and it's John 18, verses 31 through 33, this side. Flips it over, it's John 18, 37 and 38. What that told him was really interesting. It said, this document was written in a codex. A codex is where you have binding on one side and then you have pages that flip. Now, some of those of you who are younger have never seen that. It's, it's called a book by the older generation. But uh, you use, you've kind of gone retro on us because most of you just use a scroll on your computers, which is really archaic technology. But nevertheless, it was Christians who were the first to popularize the codex form. The scroll was the only form of book known in the first century AD until the last decade. We don't know who invented the codex, but we know for the next five centuries, 80% of all Christian books were written on a codex. Only 20% of all non-Christian books were written on a codex. And then after that, the whole world decided we're going to adopt the codex form. It's the only time in the history of the Christian church where we have been ahead of the technological curve. Uh, normally, we're way behind on those issues, but it was nice to know about that at least. Well, here's this fragment. C.H. Roberts looks at it and he said, you know, I think this thing is, is very old. I think it goes back to the first half of the second century. He sent it to the three leading papyrologists of his day. And each one said, this manuscript, independently from each other, this manuscript should be dated no later than A.D. 150 and probably as early as A.D. 100. A fourth demurred, and he said, no, I think it was written in the 90s. Well, what I was taught in California where I grew up is, generally speaking, the copy of a manuscript is not written before the original of that manuscript. Isn't that what you're taught here? It makes sense to me. Here's a manuscript that can't be dated after 150, but it's a copy of the Gospel of John. How can you have the original dated to 170? It's not going to happen. This sent two tons of European scholarship to the flames. 
And it reminds me of a little ditty on a professor's desk. An ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. Or in this case, an ounce of evidence is worth two tons of presumption. But has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Here's another way to think about this. In 1611, when the King James Bible was produced, the New Testament was based essentially on seven manuscripts, the oldest of, went, of which went back to the 11th century. Now, 402 years later, we have nearly a thousand times as many manuscripts, some of which go back almost a thousand years earlier than what the King James translation was based on. As time goes on, we're, we haven't neglected those manuscripts. We haven't forgotten about them. We still have them, and we have a lot more. Every time somebody translates the Bible, they don't say, well, I've got to take this manuscript that I translate from and destroy that now. That's stupid. We don't do that. It's never been done in the history of the church. Those manuscripts are still, to this day, found. So the bottom line of the first point is that as time goes on, we're getting closer and closer to the original text. The number of variants is due to the number of manuscripts, and the date of those manuscripts combined with the number of those manuscripts tells us we're getting closer, not farther away from the original text. Well, what about the nature of the variants? What kinds of variants do we actually have? <coughs> Excuse me. It's really loud. I've got to figure out how to do that with these things a little better. 99% make virtually no difference at all. Most of them can't even be translated. For example, differences in spelling are a very common thing that you get in, <laughs> sorry, in the manuscripts. They didn't know how to spell any better than you know how to spell today, but you got spell check on your computers. They didn't have those things back then. The name John is spelled two different ways. Every single time it occurs in the New Testament, the name of John is spelled two different ways in the, in the manuscripts. Doesn't affect anything, though. Can't be even translated. The smallest group of variants are those that are both meaningful and viable. That is, they have a good chance of being authentic and they affect the meaning of the text to some degree. Less than 1% of all textual variants fit this group. In fact, it's closer to one-fourth of 1%. So Bart Ehrman says, we could go on practically forever talking about the textual variants of the New Testament. Yes, but you'd bore people to death if you did that because most of them are totally irrelevant for anything. It's one-fourth of 1% that affect things. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. Mark 9.29, Jesus' disciples try to do an exorcism. They try to uh, destroy these demons, cast them out, and they were unsuccessful. Jesus says this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. Most later manuscripts have the words and fasting. The earlier manuscripts just end the sentence with prayer. And so scholars have debated this. When you do an exorcism of a particularly nasty demon, is fasting necessary or not? And as you can see from me, I hold to the shorter reading. <laughs> but it's, it's a question. It affects not doctrine, but it affects our practice. Here's one that affects some interesting things. Let the one who has insight calculate the beast's number, the Antichrist number. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Well, not so fast. In 1843, a German scholar went to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and he deciphered a manuscript that had been scraped over and rewritten on 800 years later. This manuscript was from the 5th century, from the 400s. It ended up being the second most important manuscript we have for the book of Revelation. And he found, when he got to Revelation 13, that the number of the beast was 616, not 666. This manuscript has become a very, very important manuscript for us for trying to get back to the original text of Revelation. But it was the only one that had the number of the beast as 616. Until 1998, when a small papyrus fragment was found at Oxford University's Ashmolean Museum that has half a million papyri. And they found 26 different fragments of this manuscript spread out over nine chapters in Revelation. There's one that's a postage size stamp of Revelation 13, 18. I had the privilege of looking at both of these manuscripts in the last few years. And I can verify that both of them say 616. This papyrus is the earliest manuscript we have for Revelation. And the other manuscript is the second most important one we have for Revelation. It may well be that the number of the beast is 616. I don't know for sure. It would take two or three hundred hours of research to, to determine this. And even then, I wouldn't know. Now, most scholars, to be sure, would say the number of the beast is 666. The, the, 
the, the uh, 616, that's, that's the neighbor of the beast. He lives a few door down, you know, so <laughs> something like that. This is a meaningful variant. It's a viable variant. But how meaningful is it? I know of no Bible college, no theological seminary, no church, no denomination, no Christian institute of any kind that says this in its doctrinal statement. We believe in the virgin birth of Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe in the Trinity. And we believe that the number of the beast is 666. It may be important, but it's not that important. But if we put 616 in the next iteration of Bible translations, it'll send about seven tons of popular Christian literature to the flames. Think about seeing that in your Bible sometime. What theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? We can actually deal with this one really quickly. In Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, Sir Lee Teabing says, my dear, speaking to Sophie, until that moment in history, he's talking about the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325, and he's claiming that Constantine the emperor was there dictating what they should believe. Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. What Dan Brown is arguing is that Constantine invented the deity of Christ in the fourth century. Now, even though this is a novel, he's claiming that it's based on genuine historical facts that are prior to the time of the novel. Two of my boys were in college at different major universities in this country when this book came out. And when it came out the next semester, each one of them heard a professor say, finally a book that has destroyed the, the, the myth of Christianity. Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. That's where we are today. Well, you remember how I told you that an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption? Here's another ounce of evidence. This is another papyrus, P66, written about 150 years prior to the Council of Nicaea. This is John chapter 1 in this manuscript, one of the most important manuscripts we have on John's Gospel. Read along with me, if you would, at verse 1. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, you've never heard that verse like that before, have you? I mean, this is prior to Constantine, who invented the deity of Christ. 150 years before Constantine. And yet here it is in black and white, or in this case, brown and white. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which is exactly what every single manuscript we have for John 1.1 1, 1 says. Every one of them. Constantine didn't invent the deity of Christ. And this kind of illustration can be multiplied over and over and over again. So that when you look at the resurrection of Christ, you look at his deity, his virgin birth, salvation by, by faith, salvation by grace, the Trinity, any essential doctrines, not a single one is impacted by any of these viable variants. All these cardinal beliefs are secure. Not one is affected by it. In fact, let me quote from that skeptic. We've already mentioned him, Bart Ehrman. In the appendix to his book, Misquoting Jesus, he was asked by the editors, why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? His answer? Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. What? Tens of thousands of people left the Christian faith because they thought that the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith were affected by textual variants because of having read this book. And yet now he has to admit that's not the case. We've debated each other three times, and every time I show his quotation on this point, and he can't refute it, because he knows that's what he said, he knows that he, what, that's what he believes. So consequently, uh, the kind of debate gets over pretty quickly at that point. Is what we have now what they wrote then? In all particulars? I don't know. Probably not. 666, 616, fasting and prayer, I'm not exactly sure. But in all essentials? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In all essentials, not a single one of these things is affected by any of these variants. Now, doesn't that encourage you? What you have in your hands today in all essentials is the very word of God. Don't let it collect dust on your shelf. Read it. Meditate on it. Let it get into your life. And let it change your life. This year, make a commitment to read the scriptures. I conclude with this. No essential Christian belief is jeopardized by any viable variant. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your great goodness to us. 
for giving us the scriptures, for giving us men and women through the centuries who have copied them faithfully and carefully, even though they made mistakes, for letting us see that no essential teaching of the scriptures is invalidated by these textual variants, as many as they may be. You are a great God whose son, Jesus Christ, is our savior. And the scriptures infallibly point to him as the one who has come to die in our place and be raised from the dead. Enable us to believe in him, Lord, and not just to believe in him, but, but to follow him with all of our hearts and our minds and our souls. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.